Hi everyone and welcome to the latest presentation in our Giving Psychology Away project where we give you a short overview of a psychological theory with some ideas of how you can take this into your practice. Today I'm going to be talking about a narrative therapy technique called externalising the problem and I'm Dr Sarah Taylor-Whiteway, a senior psychologist in the Schools and Community Psychology Service. So what is externalising? At the very simple level, this is the idea that by talking about the problem using slightly different language, we can make the problem that we're trying to deal with external to the person. And when we do this, then the person is much more likely to have a better sense of themselves and what their own strengths are and have, a, have better self-esteem. We know that that's really important for children and young people. So the Externalising looks like this in reality. Rather than saying, I am depressed, you could say something like, I have depression. So it's rather than the problem being the whole part of yourself, it's just something that affects you. So this idea has come from the work of Michael White and David Epstein in around the late 80s and early 90s. And this is a famous quote of theirs that helps us understand what we're trying to achieve with narrative therapy. So this is the idea that the problem is the problem and the person is not the pro problem. So talking about I have depression takes it away from you being the problem and you being the depression. So why does it work? A little bit about the theory here. So when we talk about the problem as being separate, as being external from the person, it means it doesn't define them and other descriptions of what that is important to that person and what that person is about can be found so we can find solutions in this way um, and it, it means that a person doesn't just have to be about the problem even if they're getting very angry and that's the problem and that's happening every single day they can still be angry as well as being kind to their peers it means that anger doesn't take over them completely and by externalising this problem, we make it tangible and we can build this idea that the problem can be controlled rather than it just being a part of a person they're never going to be able to change or control. And finally, when we distance ourselves from the problem, when we don't think we are the problem, we can talk about it and we reduce then the blame and the judgement that comes with when a person feels they're the problem, which means we have a lot more autonomy to change it. One of the really nice things about using externalising is that all it is is a simple shift in our language which moves away from language which promotes the problem being within the child or young person and gives this idea that it is external to them. So there's a few examples on this page of externalising language rather than within child language. So to just run through a couple of examples. On the left hand column, we have the externalizing language. So how long has depression been affecting you is externalizing rather than saying something like, how long have you been depressed? Or well, the second example, what does depression tell you about yourself? That's externalizing the problem, whereas we might classically have used, how do you feel when you're depressed? So here we're promoting the language in the left hand column. And on the last slide, I was using the example of depression, but we can use all sorts of problems. So on this side, in the square brackets, I've put in the example of what we might be talking about, but this can be replaced with anything. And we try and use the child's language for what they want to call things. So for a child with behaviour difficulties, maybe they're getting angry and frustrated in class, we might call this, this difficulty Mr Angry. And we could ask a question like, how long has Mr Angry been affecting you? And then the other two examples of worry or distractibility show how this can work with all sorts of different problems. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about how we can use some of the externalising type questions with a child or young person, give you some examples of the kind of questions we might want to ask. So I always start with asking the child to try and draw a picture of what they think their problem would look like. And this is just from their imagination. You'll see an example of this um, on the left here with Mr. Muddle and what they thought that looked like. And I think 
it really helps at this stage to try and think about the problem being sat there in the room with you. So this creates the idea of it being external, something that can exist alongside the child. So we always try and give the problem a name. It can be anything they want to call it. It can be Mr. Muddle, like this person has chosen, or just a random name. And then we start asking questions about when did it first come into your life? So when did they first notice that this problem was there, or sitting on the seat next to them? We ask them what, how they think this problem makes them behave. So when that problem is there and present in their life, how do they behave differently? And this could be confusion, this could be shouting, this could be running away, anything they think they do when the problem is there. What influence does this problem have on your life? So trying to get them to see the big impact it has when it's there. It could be just on friends, it could be on work, it could be on family relationships. And then what influence can you have on the problem? So this is asking more, is there any times when they have fought back against the problem? So have they managed to control it somehow? Or when they think about it, um, can they do something a bit different to control it? And the second, the question after this, have you ever stopped the problem from entering your life? It's just like this as well. So anytime they've noticed that the problem wasn't there and they've done something differently, they would stop it coming in basically. And is there anything that helps them do that when they can think of times when they could stand up to the problem? So was it that a teacher helped them do something or was it when they were feeling calm and they were allowed to go to a special room or something like that? And can they tell when that problem isn't sitting there in the room? Can they tell when what it feels like? And that's the final question there. So now we've had those kind of initial conversations. Where would we go next with this technique? So first of all, we need to use this technique quite consistently to make it effective. So we don't want to have one day a conversation about anger sitting in a chair with us and what it might be called and how it affects you. And the next day refer to the person as being very angry and you let and, and your anger did this. So we need to be quite consistent with using and externalizing the problem at all times. But gradually, as we use this, we'll feel that person distancing from their problem a bit more and understanding it a bit better. So we can also use this, this language after significant incidences involving the problem. So have they had a panic attack and the problem is anxiety or have they got very become very angry and the problem is anger? Um, so we can ask these kind of simple questions like how did the problem gain power over you? So why we're basically asking why did that the problem come to you at that time? Um, what got in the way of you taking power back? So why was it difficult to manage and control that feeling in that moment? Um, and if you're talking to them when they're a bit calmer or they've moved on, how have you got power back now? So what did they do to re-regulate? That's the kind of question. Um, and what could we do the next time this problem visits? So we could think about maybe building in some autonomy to do something a bit different next time. So the person's basically, we want them to be able to reach a, an understanding of how it influences them, when it's the most powerful, when it happens the most, and ways to combat it. And we're going to have to have these conversations quite a few times maybe to get there and repeat them and, as I say, be really consistent with our language at all times. But basically when they get there, when they see themselves as being detached from the shame of the thing that's happened, then they're basically, we're going to have a lot more possibility for them to change this into the future, for them to take some control over the problem. And just a couple of thoughts about when you can use this. So there isn't an age limit, um, upper or lower, on when you could use this, but obviously it's a very language-based intervention, so we want to use it with children that are understanding our language. Um, it also helps to think about the difference between reality and imagination with that child. Obviously, we're kind of imagining this problem being a person or a thing, and they need to realise that it's not real, that there isn't some Mr Angry sitting on their shoulder. Um, Again, I've mentioned before, it can be used with all sorts of behaviours, obviously within limits if we're seeing anything that we're clinically worried about, like eating disorders and self-harm, those kind of things. Please do talk to your educational psychologist or CAMS, but actually you can use it for lots of different range of behaviours. 
And just a little tip on how to introduce it is I often say we're going to do something a bit fun or a bit silly today. So don't take the child doesn't take the situation too seriously. And with older children, you can sometimes even explain why it works that can help them get on board with this idea. So hopefully this has given you a bit of an idea of ways to start externalising with young people. Um, here are just a few tips that might help you to start using this technique. So using the word it rather than you is just a really simple way that means you're externalising the problem. So um, Paul was upset when you got angry today is not externalising the problem, but Paul was upset when it got angry today. You can see how it just changes to it is something else, the thing sitting in the room with us. Really start with simple questions such as the name is a problem or what it looks like. We might have to do a lot of that drawing it, talking about it with a name before we can go on to things such as like when is it that present, when does it come, what powers do you have over it and its effect. And remember that sometimes you can people can feel like using this technique to, is taking away responsibility for the child for their action but actually what we're doing is we want that those actions and that problem to go away and the way to do this is to empower that person to feel like they have um, the chance to control it a bit better and it, we need to basically build a sense that we're not shaming them and we're not judging them for them to be able to do this better so that's what we're doing with this technique so if you're really interested in this technique and you're wondering if there's any other resources that you can use, um, there's two really good examples here. So The Red Beast is a book by uh, K.I. Al Ghani and it talks about anger as being this external creature and beast. And really helpfully, there's a YouTube video of the book being read out that you can do if you Google um, The Red Beast on YouTube and gives you a really good sense of how to use externalizing. And Starving the Anger Gremlin and Starving the Exam Stress Gremlin, there's lots of books in this series. They all use externalizing, basically talking about the problem as this little gremlin. So having a look at getting one or two of those books and having a look at how they talk about the problem is also would be really good for your practice. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, then please talk to your Link EP about this approach. Um, and we hope you have fun using it.